May God be in my head and in my heart and in my understanding. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Merry Christmas again, by the way. I was at a meeting of preachers uh, just about two weeks ago now. It was a Zoom meeting of preachers from many different denominations. And as the meeting ended, the president of our little group gave this word of advice to all of us preachers as we went out, signed off of that meeting, because most of us were going to work on our Christmas sermon about then. (laughs) What he said was this. He said, just tell the story. Because the story is a powerful story. It is a powerful story. It's a story about God's power at work in the lives of people that nobody then and nobody now would have seen as very powerful. It's a story about a peasant couple living in Nazareth, Joseph the carpenter, and his very pregnant wife, Mary. It's a story of Mary and Joseph uprooted from their home in Nazareth by a census called by Caesar Augustus a man of great power in a city far, far away. Here's a couple who was powerless to resist that size to go to be counted in Bethlehem. They were powerless to do anything except set out on what must have been about probably an 80 or an 81 mile journey. With Joseph walking, And with Mary riding on the back of a donkey, traveling down a very dusty, bumpy dirt road for days. This is a story of God made manifest in the birth of a child, the child Jesus. And here's the thing. Not only were children in that day the least powerful among anybody in those lands, But in this case, this baby did not even enter the world in a proper room. The Savior of the world, in this powerful story, is born in a stable because there's no room for him in the end. This is a story of shepherds with their sheep. Shepherds, not always a very well-respected occupation because... As nomadic shepherds, it meant that they went from place to place following pastures where they could allow their sheep to graze, sometimes wandering down into the villages nearby. They were not always very welcomed. They were not always very clean. They also certainly were not regarded as a powerful influence in the workings of the Roman Empire. But we find in this story that it's these least welcome of people who are the first to hear of the Messiah's birth. Yes, we know this story well. But you see, there's an additional story going on here. There's a back story. And that's the story of Caesar Augustus, the emperor of the extensive and powerful Roman Empire. The powerful man mentioned in the opening lines of this story about Mary and Joseph and Jesus and shepherds and angels. And for us to fully register the impact of this story, this powerful story about the baby Jesus born in a stable, it helps to know a few things about the story of Caesar Augustus, the powerful emperor of the whole Roman world. Because when the baby Jesus enters this world, he slips quietly into a world that worships Caesar Augustus. Caesar's story is the story of an empire's power. The empire story of Caesar Augustus is reflected in an inscription that was found in Western Turkey. It's an inscription that was in stone, probably from a stone, maybe a cornerstone in a a building in that part of Turkey. 
The inscription is dated 9 BCE, before the Common Era, what we used to call just BC before Christ. <laughs> so a few years, 9 BCE would be a few years before the birth of Jesus. And what's especially interesting about the text in this inscription is that it proclaims Augustus as the god of Augustus. And it proclaims that Augustus was sent to this earth as a savior to put an end to war and to bring, and these are the words, good tidings. That Augustus was sent to bring good tidings to the people of the then known world. Because of course the Roman Empire you know, extended much beyond just Rome and its surrounding regions. And what's more, it's true, and history records, that the reign of Caesar Augustus as emperor did indeed initiate what turned out to be two centuries of relative peace throughout what we would call the Roman Empire. But you see, what is also true about the story is that Augustus achieved this peace through military might and political shrewdness. One critic wrote, it was a bloody peace. The story of Caesar Augustus is a story in which might makes right. Whereas the story of Jesus is a story of God showing us what right looks like by raising up the unmind. The story of Caesar Augustus is a story in which exploitation of the world around him and the people around him, where that exploitation ensures his success. Whereas the story of Jesus is a story about losing an exploitive advantage. In fact, losing much of any advantage. And it makes way for a new, different, ultimately more fulfilling way of being in the world. What's more is that the story which belongs to Caesar Augustus, in that story, it's easy for us to tell who the winners and the losers are. Whereas in the story of Jesus, the real winners and the real losers are not so easy to tell apart. But the story of Caesar Augustus is not the story we tell each year around this time, is it? We don't have some kind of little scene to bless of the Roman Empire. <laughs> and that's because the story of Caesar Augustus is primarily the story of how worldly power works. How you do things if you're going to have power and get power in the world. While the story of Jesus is a testament to the divine power that's at work in the world regardless of what worldly power does. Whether there's an empire or not, the divine power of God working in the story we hear about Jesus is a power that works hidden, not very loud and flashy, even in the midst of a very powerful Roman Empire. And you know the truth is this, when we look at the history of the world, the kind of power to which the world gives such resounding glory like it did to Caesar and the Roman Empire, that kind of power never seems to last for all time, does it? It may last for a long time, but it doesn't last for all time. Just look at the Roman Empire. There was a time when it rose up, and there was a time when it fell down. And if you look at all the empires of the world that came before the Roman Empire, there was a time when they rose up and a time when they fell down. And if you look at the empires that have come since the Roman Empire fell, those empires too have risen up, and then they have fallen down. You see, time and again, history has shown that the fragility of the kind of power that powers an empire 
seems always to have a, a hidden flaw. But here's the thing. The power of God lasts way beyond the hidden flaws of empire. Because it's the kind of power that powers the whole universe. And divine power is always at work, regardless of what we see, and regardless of what people in power do. We see divine power at work in the world whenever a hand reaches out to raise up the lowly whom the mighty have put down. We see divine power in that. We see divine power at work whenever a voice speaks out for the stewardship of this earth, our island home, and for all that dwells therein, rather than for the exploitation <laughs> that would give some of us a worldly advantage. We see divine power at work in the world. Whenever what appears to be lost to us, and there are so many times when different things feel like they are just lost to us, the divine power is at work when what appears to be lost motivates us to hope rather than to despair. When the divine power that powers the universe enters the human condition, it enters in a way that looks very different from worldly power. And sometimes divine power yields outcomes that even to the rest of the world look like failure rather than like success. That's why allowing ourselves to be instruments of divine power always depends on human hearts. Depends on human hearts, which in the midst of everything that seems to be broken, refuse to despair, but instead human hearts that dare to hope. Only when we dare to still hope in the face of what seems to be God's silence. Only when we dare to hope do we find ourselves in position to participate in the birth of God's new creation, which God is already at work creating, whether we see it or not. In the third verse of a popular Christmas carol, a little town of Bethlehem, a lot of times when we sing these carols, we want to get past the first verse. You know, you go out caroling and you sing one verse of every one. The third verse, it says, How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls and hear meek doesn't mean weak, it means open where meek souls will receive him still. The dear Christ enters in. It really is a straightforward story we tell. When we tell this Christmas story every Christmas Eve. Straightforward story about hope. In the face of situations that seem mostly hopeless. So may each of us find the hope we need this Christmas. And may the divine power, which powers the universe, play room in your heart. Amen. Amen. Amen.